The reading is from Exodus, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians, and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them, so come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. The word of the Lord. Well, we are beginning a five-week series on discernment and and how it works uh, in our lives and what it means for us uh, individually going forward uh, as God uh, calls each of us uh, to various ministries and tasks and things like that in our lives, but not only individually for us, but also as a congregation as we look forward into the future where God might be calling us. And in order to do so, we're looking at uh, some pretty famous discernment stories that come out of Scripture, and, and this week, uh, this story is, is, is perhaps so famous that we, that we miss the, the sheer strangeness of it all. Uh, last week, for example, we talked about Elijah and, and God coming in the sheer silence of that, and, and that seems a little uh, like one of the things God would do. But today, God uh, comes in a bush, a burning bush. And, and, and we cannot lose the fact that basically the story that was just read for us takes place between a bush and a human being. All right, you know sometimes when God gets talking, you think that you know all of a sudden God starts looking, you know, you know, like George Clooney. And uh, but in reality, here what's going on is that that Moses is talking to a bush. I just want to point that out because sometimes you know we go out in our lives and we see people doing strange things. I'm sure you know as Jethro was wandering by, going, "Why aren't you taking care of the sheep?" And Moses is like, "I'm having a conversation." Because I often wonder, for example, you know, this, this burning bush, I mean, it, you know, is this the usual path? I mean, Moses is about 40 years old when, he, when this story takes place, uh, and he has uh, become, uh, moved into Midian to be with his father-in-law and help take care of the sheep, uh, who is Jethro. And I often wonder if this was something that, is this a path that Moses took every day? You know, so this is something that he saw every day. Uh, sort of those of you who commute on the same route every day wherever you go, and you just kind of see it, and then one day all of a sudden it's, it's a burning bush, and you're like, well, that's interesting. Uh, or is this a place where Moses had rarely gone? He never used this particular path. He was leading the sheep to a different pasture, and, and this was brand new to him, and, and then all of a sudden he sees this burning bush and says, oh, burning bush path, you know, uh, things like that. Because, you know, that bush could have been, you know, lit for 14 years waiting for somebody to come by saying, please, someone talk to me. But what's interesting, right, is that Moses sees a burning bush that's not consumed. And he says to himself, 
This is what I think is so fascinating, the way this story has come down to us. He sees this bush that's burning and is not consumed, and he says, I must go and see what this is. Now, because the rest of the story is so important, to not only to the life of Moses, but indeed to all of our ancestors and, and our entire Jewish tradition, we oftentimes just skip over the fact that one of the things that makes Moses so important in his understanding of, of what God is asking him to do is that when he sees something like a burning bush that is not consumed, he says to himself, I need to check this out. To have that curiosity that when he sees something completely strange and weird and out of the ordinary, to not be fearful of it, to not try to put out the fire, but rather instead to check it out and see what this is all about. It's that driving curiosity, I think, that is so important for us to understand when we're talking about our discernment with God. Because we hold that God is around us all the time and at all spaces. And we also hold that God is the Word in Jesus Christ, which means God is constantly communicating. But how often do we take the weird thing and say, well, maybe... God is talking to me here in this strange event. So we've got to give Moses credit for at least wandering around and saying, I've got to stop, take time out of what I'm planning to do, what the schedule calls for, what the sheep need to check out this burning bush. And so then he immediately he starts to walk toward it, and the bush, st bush starts talking. Now, as your day goes, if you see a bush that's burning and not consumed, that's weird enough. But when it starts talking, you've got to admit, you've kind of hit the twilight zone. And the bush says, relax. You're on holy ground. And so Moses takes off his sandals, very, very traditional thing to do when one's on holy ground. We don't do it so much anymore. Most of you wear your shoes when you come to get communion. But um, if you didn't, I'd at least say, hey, way to be like Moses. So Moses approaches, approaches this, this holy ground and this conversation with God. And, and in the process now, he has a conversation. And it's important that we take a look at what some of this conversation is about. Now, it just so happens that once Moses gets there, he's responded with the here I am. And there are lots of times actually in Scripture where God calls people, says their name, Moses or Isaiah, and they respond, here I am. But it's also a little known fact that the immediate response after that is, I probably shouldn't have said that. And Moses says, here I am, and he approaches God, and all of a sudden, Moses finds himself in a very, very strange predicament. Because God says, I am the God of our ancestors. I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac. And at that moment, all the strangeness aside of a burning bush and a talking bush, taking off his shoes and being in the presence of some bush that knows his name, he realizes that now he is in the, pro in the presence of God and he hides his face. And it's that act now that Moses, his face hidden by his cloak, that he and the bush have this conversation. This conversation that works between Moses and God where Moses can't even look anymore at this burning bush. And the Lord relates that God has heard and observed the misery of the people down in Egypt. And God has seen what has been going on there. There now has arisen a Pharaoh who no longer knew of Joseph. And so now the Israelite people are in slavery. And God has heard their sufferings and God needs to find somebody, in this case Moses, to go and relieve the Hebrew children of their suffering, to bring them to a new land, land filled with milk and honey, 
a land that, albeit, has a few people in it, like Canaanites and Perizzites and Hivites and all the other ones. And it's Moses who God has asked to go to release the people from their slavery. And here's where the story gets interesting. Because when God asks you to do something, of course it's God. And of course you're going to say, oh, sure. Unless you're Moses. And Moses says, ah, uh, I really wasn't supposed to be on this road. I think you need the next guy coming. Because the first thing Moses says is, um, here's verse 13, for example. Moses says to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of our ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what name? In what name do you say this? In other words, Moses is like, let's negotiate. <laughs> if you're going to ask me to do something, I need to have a little more information than just a talking bush. So for example, who are you, God of my ancestors? What is your name? And the bush says in English, and I'll translate it, I am who I am. Now, the bush actually gives God's name, and this is the only time in Scripture where God's name is mentioned. I am who I am. And in fact, in the Hebrew tradition, just saying God's name brings God to your presence. Which is why in the Hebrew tradition, they don't say God's name. Because it's very inconvenient in the midst of some things to say God's name and have God actually show up. So, for example, back when Chris and I lived in Chicago, and traffic is miserable, if you've ever, we lived on the north side up by Wrigley Field, and it was super miserable back in those days. And uh, there's never a place to park, and there's always double, triple parking on the streets, and there's cars going and trucks delivering and garbage, and it's just a mess all the time. And we were at one particularly busy intersection with this little Mazda pickup truck. There was a time in our lives when Chris and I had enough possessions that we could fill up a Mazda pickup truck. Now it would pretty much take a Beacons moving hall and an airplane. But back in those days, we were in this little pickup truck. I was making a left turn in the middle of a busy intersection, and in front of me was a brand new, spanking, brand new Jaguar. Very impressive. And its license plate was the name of God. And in the middle of this street, I'm backing up. And Chris, who is very skeptical about my driving skills in general, pretty much on this particular case, thought I was just bringing us to death. And she goes, what are you doing? And I said, the Jaguar, read the license plate. She goes, oh my gosh, go faster, go faster, because the last thing you want is God to be ticked off that somebody put God's name on a Jaguar. Clearly it was a Cadillac, that God's preference. But they don't say God's name. I am who I am. So then Moses says, well, if I say that, they're going to ask me to prove it. And it just so happens that Moses is a shepherd. I bet you were wondering why this was there. He's got one of these. He's got a staff. So Moses, uh, so, so the bush says, take your staff, throw it on the ground. Moses throws it on the ground, becomes a snake. Bush says, whenever anyone questions you about whether I am who I am, you just take your staff and something miraculous will happen. Now Moses is like, okay. But Moses isn't done yet. He's still negotiating. And he says, all right, listen. Bush. Maybe you called him Mr. Bush. I don't know. The Honorable Bush. I don't know. He says, listen. You, you know who you're talking to, right? I'm Moses. I'm not really good at the old public speaking, going, you know, in front of Pharaoh thing that you seem to want. And the bush says, I beg to differ. 
And so the bush says, just so happens, though, your brother Aaron is coming up the hill here, and uh, pretty soon he's going to start questioning your sanity because you're talking to a bush. And, uh, but I'll bring Aaron, you can bring Aaron along, and he'll do all the speaking for you. And at that point, Aaron does indeed show up. Moses tells him what has happened, why he is talking to this bush. And the two of them leave the employ of Jethro and head to Egypt. But it turns out that for all of his doubts and for all of his skepticism that Moses had about whether this bush had picked the right one, the right person to lead the people out of Egypt, Moses was uniquely qualified to do what God had asked him to do. Because you see, in those 40 years previous, before he became a shepherd on a hill in Midian, Moses grew up in the court of the Pharaoh. He knew how to speak the language. He knew the customs of the court. Now granted, he had left under some dubious circumstances, but he left because his own people were being abused. And he knew the slavery. But he didn't quite know what to do. And so when God asks Moses through this burning bush to go and release the people, Moses, in his doubts and in his skepticism, goes. And for you and I, who are called by God to do things, some things that we might not understand, some things that require some negotiation, some things that require support and help. We have to somehow find in our ways that God has called the right person. This weekend always brings a, a huge problem for me. My oldest daughter, her birthday was Friday. My youngest daughter's birthday is tomorrow. I have two days in between to contemplate my life and try to see if I can keep my checkbook. But I can vividly remember Chris telling me that we were going to have a child, and I could think of nobody more woefully inadequate to be a parent than me. And I asked if indeed I was the father, just in case I had an out. I did not. And the second time it happened, clearly I had lost my mind. I mean, I spent most of Rachel's first two years, the kids are almost exactly two years apart, I spent most of Rachel's first two years wondering why I did it. When I found out I had done it again, I pretty much was committing myself. You know, the kids are now almost 30. I don't know anything more about being a parent than I did 30 years ago. I wish they'd had any of you that had, had a chance. We don't know what we're called to do. We don't know the ways in which God is going to ask us to be a parent or lead the Egyptian or lead the Israelites out of Egypt, be a good neighbor, be a good friend, whatever it might be. But we have to be able to embrace the weirdness of those conversations, the weirdness of Moses talking to a burning bush. The weirdness of being presented with something like parenthood for the first time. The weirdness of being presented that God knows what God is doing and to trust in that. Because, I mean, let's face it. God's grand plan in life was to have a son who died on a cross. I mean, that's just weird. That somehow... One man, 2,000 years ago, dying on a cross has value to you and I. That some guy who gave his life and his last breath into your hands, I commend my spirit. That somehow that's what's going to change the world. That's what's going to take a world of hatred, sexual assault, and sexual abuse and change it into a world of peace and hope. That somehow a guy dying on a cross is going to be able to take with his last breath a world filled with deceit, lying, greed, and avarice and change it into generosity, compassion, and hope.
There are a ton of weird things that happen in our lives. And Moses and his story allows us to embrace the weirdness and to be able to talk to God in a way that allows us to see that God has our best interests in heart. And we might not understand. We might feel woefully inadequate to the task called to us, but God will provide. I mean, here's a list of accomplishments of the things Moses did, just in case you're wondering what he did. I mean, he, he led them out of slavery. They crossed the Red Sea. You may remember that. That staff came in handy. He went to this mountain, this Mount Horeb, brought down the Ten Commandments. All right? He spent 40 years shepherding these people and all their whining and all their crying and all their, oh, we're too hard and oh, and, uh, we hate freedom and uh, we'd rather be enslaved and yada, 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 yada. He spent all that time patiently leading people, healing them, feeding them, guiding them. So much so that Moses... When he dies, they write this. This is the last thing that, uh, excuse me, this is the last thing they write about Moses. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy. It's the last three verses. So here's this guy. Talked to a burning bush. Did what God asked him to do. For 40 years, took care of God's people, led them right to the promised land, went to the promised land. Never got to go to the promised land. No, no, no. God took Moses up to Mount Nebo and said, there's the promised land, but you don't get to go. And here's how the book of Deuteronomy ends. Verse 10, chapter 34. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and the entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of Israel. There has never since nor ever will be an ancestor or Jew as great as Moses. And it all started because one day on his way to work, he saw a burning bush and he had enough curiosity to stop and talk to it. May it be true for you and I as well. Amen.